Okay, so um, <clears throat> this summer I decided I wanted to go across the Yukon and across Alaska. And uh, so there was a few sort of plans in the pipeline, but uh, so anyway, we'll just take it as it comes here. So I started off in Alaska and that brings you down, I started down here in Homer and I came up here to Anchorage, across here, I went north, northeast, across the Yukon, uh, down to the southern part of the Yukon to a place called Haines and then I hopped on a ferry all the way down here through the islands here, the um, beautiful landscaped islands here, down to a place called Bellingham where I met Orla Knight who's here tonight <laughs> and woo, she was here, she joined me for 10 days and we went from here uh, down around Washington, Olympic National Park, down through Oregon, down through uh, California and down to San Francisco. So it was two and a half thousand miles on the bike for me, and uh, it was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> so the usual genuine or the general stuff of just getting everything ready, and then over on the top right you'll see laminating city of maps and instructions and all that sort of stuff, and also the thing with the bike, just getting the bike ready. So any time I do these. Uh, fabulous trips and uh, just getting the bike fully serviced but it didn't need much work at all. I landed in the plane in Anchorage and that's the first sign I saw. Guns, ammo, holsters. <laughs> and that one was just one of the settings for the whole <laughs> <laughs> uh, And on the arrival in Anchorage the first thing I had to do was prepare for the bears because and then uh, I don't know who's there your shades sorry thanks very much. Uh, the air horn here uh, I had to buy an air horn, I had to buy a water filter this is the most important thing, bear spray. So the bear spray is basically, I don't know how Too I would use it really. They say, uh, when you're 30 feet before a, a bear, you spray at his nostrils. And he should be <laughs> but uh, it is your only chance of getting it. And then this is the bear barrel. I have the bear barrel over beside Andreas over there, if anybody wants to see it this evening. Uh, so my first night in Anchorage, I well, first of all arrived very late, but then I met this motley crew. And this is Lorcan. Lance. This is Lorcan here and Paul O'Connell and uh, Me Hall, and they were part of the gang that were climbing Denali. So they were my first mistake. <laughs> <laughs> I'd arranged to meet Dave Gotham, who's a great friend of mine, but these guys are going to be presenting uh, the very first, not next week now, not next Thursday, but the very first Thursday, they're going to be talking about climbing Denali. So they had just finished climbing Denali, and they were all full of the joys. They were flying home yesterday, and let's have more beer. <laughs> and I was starting my cycle the next day, but uh, how, <laughs> how I got them into coming down to Kinvara for the adventure talks is they said, we'll have one more, and I was there, I have enough, I'm going home. And they said, one more, and I said, I'll have one more if you do the Kinvara adventure talks. Yay! <laughs> so they'll be here the next month. You just kept Saturday. doing that 20 times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So this is the first day out of Anchorage, and again, like in America, like Canada, and a lot, a lot of these places, the bike paths are just spectacular. They're really, really amazing. So the cycle paths, along with the famous trains in America and Alaska, Canada, and just beautiful scenery as I went along. But as I was going along, I started, it started getting heavier and heavier smoke. And it was my first encounter with uh, smoke. And I had, uh, you can see, we're here, I'm here in Stirling, so I'd come down from Anchorage. But sorry, I should have said at the beginning, I uh, wanted to start in Homer, but I'd been sitting on a plane for literally two days. And I just wanted to get in the bike. So if you see Anchorage here, I came down along here, along this road, along this, sorry, along this road, and I cycled to Homer first, and then I got a bus back to Anchorage, and then I started my cycle from there. But as I came to Stirling, you can see Stirling on the map there, the smoke was getting heavier and heavier, and uh, it really actually was quite detrimental. So the, I talk in this video about a guy giving me an air, a, a mask, which is under that buff, and that was the fireman. He said, you shouldn't be cycling in this. But, uh, okay, <coughs> it's uh, day two, and I'm in Kuala National Park, and there's a big uh, fire up in the mountain. So down here is pretty smoky, but uh, somebody gave me a mask, um, which is under this pink thing. So I've wet the pink thing, the buff, and the mask has a sort of a filter on it, so it's hard to breathe. It takes an effort, as it feels like I'm at altitude. <laughs> because it takes an extra effort to, to take a breath, <coughs> as you might be able to hear. 
but uh, coming up the last climb which was about 40 minutes oh my god I was fighting for air but uh, it's good and uh, when you're going less than 15 miles an hour there's a load of black flies black horse fly things so that's nice and then down all oh, they've built all these uh, fire breaks so they have them with wood or not wood uh, sand or muck so these uh, and then they've trenches of muck so you can see the so I have my head torch on and I have my uh, colour the yoke on and another 10 miles or 15 miles should get me back to the coast which will be fine can't wait pity I can't see the views but sure it's all experience okay bye okay so the fires were tough and your lungs would be burning now to be honest with you and uh, it was just especially going uphill and with that mask thing that your man gave me there's a little valve in it and it was just made the restriction of your breath very hard but uh, once I got through the smoke was great but that was one of my first signs no shooting from the road in the side of smoke <laughs> and I was there all right okay this is great this is Alaska this is the real McCoy and my first campsite I came up to this there was a restaurant type place actually and then um, they said oh yeah we have a campsite out the back but the campsite was that so they had and that was my first introduction to the lo a lot of the campsites in Alaska and the Yukon where you get them free or you can put a donation in to sort of the community parks. But all they have sometimes is a bare locker and a toilet that's in the ground. You know, one of those toilets in the ground. Yeah. So you put your stuff into a bare barrel or into the, if there's bare lockers, happy days. And then some of the places that I wasn't visiting, there was no bare locker. So you had to put into bare barrel, but I'll tell you more about that later. But that was my first night sort of out in the outback. And I just thought, oh my God, this is really, Different. <laughs> so uh, I went on my merry little way and this was my first introduction to meeting really cool people. I met these this family here and they said, oh, set up beside us, we have a great campsite. So uh, like a campground, they used to go there every weekend. And from then on, I just met the most really genuine good people as I went along. I thought this was a great initiative for Ireland. <laughs> I thought uh, in Ireland, I thought it would be like, because it makes sense. These are all over the place. Like kids don't float and free life jackets. And why not? You know, because in fairness, Alaska gets the same weather as us. They get colder weather, windier weather, and it works over there. So it should work for us, I think. But uh, that was just, and a couple of quirky buildings as I went along. So as I was coming down towards Homer, this was the last section. And a few people I'd met said, when you get to the summit of the hill, overlooking Homer, your mind is going to be blown. So I was, that was a, a bit of a climb up to there and I, that, that mountain was just uh, appearing more and more and more. But when you get to the top, it really does, it really is a bit mind blowing. So I have a, a short video here just to show you. So there's no uh, verbalizing, but the, basically this is uh, just, so you're at the southern tip of Alaska here. And if you look in on the left hand side here in a second, You'll see the spit, there's the spit for, that's uh, Homer. So that's where Adam Lanich lives. So you know Adam, oh, yeah. and he got okay. in contact with people there. But it is so gorgeous, it really is amazing. And Adam Lanich, who you all know, he put me in touch with a buddy of his called Suzanne Greenwood. She lived, that's where I took that blue dot there, I took that on my phone in her house. So that's, that's her house on the water. Mm -hmm. And she couldn't have been kinder. But that was, that was a pretty cool spot now, I have to say. So when you go down along the spit, this is the sort of stuff that you see. Uh, a lot of seaplanes around Alaska, a lot of seaplanes around the Yukon. Uh, a couple of people camping on the beach down in Homer. I wish I'd done that nearly, but I was, it was nicer to stay with Suzanne and meet locals. Uh, but it, just, it was just really, really, really beautiful. So just a couple of shots there. So these are all buddies of Adam's. I said I'd show you these, so I can't remember their names, but uh, I'm terrible at names, but that's Suzanne there. Uh, she was the person I was staying with. But these three guys here are really best buddies of Adam's. I thought people might be interested in that. So is Adam away? Adam, yeah, he was out fishing. Sorry, yeah, yeah. So Adam was about 300 miles out, out, to, bay, out to sea fishing, so I didn't see him. But anyway, their buddies took me on their boat, two twin 350 horsepower engines, zipped across the bay, 
and uh, we had a ball. It was we were high as kites because it was a gorgeous evening, and I stayed with them for a couple of days. Flew across the bay, we saw otters and uh, a load of seabirds, and went across to the other side where we saw the mountains. The other, uh, like in the the last shot. So I left Homer, and I had my next little adventure, which was this. Never lost, So I got a. There's one stage line or one bus that brings people from uh, Homer up to Anchorage, and this was it. So this guy was I, the bus stop first. This was a legend. This like this story, like this. I could tell you a full night story on this journey, but I won't. I won't bore you too much. But. Uh, I was the bus stop was at a boat on a trailer in the middle of the road, right? So I had to find the right boat, and Suzanne actually showed me the right boat on the right trailer that was for sale. And next thing, I was waiting there for about an hour, and next thing he came in the opposite direction and goes, "Are you Karen Weeks?" And I said, "I am. I'll be back in half an hour." <laughs> And uh, then the stage line thing pulled up, and he like the the bus was like it was me only me, and the, the bus wasn't the cleanest you ever saw. And he said it's open seating, and I was all right. So I sat in beside your man, and then the pièce de résistance was when he threw my bike in the back. There was cod, and behind here are wedges and slabs of cannabis. So, that's <laughs> so you have the bike here that he strapped in that really wasn't strapped in. I, I'm glad it didn't get damaged. The, we fresh, well, you know, freshly gutted cod, and in here that's all slabs of cam cannabis which we delivered on the way. <laughs> then, as we were halfway, we picked up uh, this guy and his dad, and they'd been uh, out shooting for five days. Now, to me, he didn't look too roughed up after five days, but anyway, that's a different story. But when I came up to them, I said, uh, he had what looked like a guitar case on his shoulder, and I said, Jesus, is that a guitar case? And he just looked at me and said, that's my gun. Because <laughs> <laughs> it was in the case, and I was there, oh God. But anyway, we swapped drivers halfway, and as we were going up, more steam kept coming out of the engine, and so we'd try and get up, there's a lot of steep climbs coming in and out of Homer, so we'd try and get up the climb, and if we saw a river, <coughs> the, the van had stopped, we'd all get out, we all had to take a bucket, you can see the buckets there, yes. go up to the river, fill the bucket full of water, <laughs> come back, put it in the engine, and go another one out. It was like, it was just a calamity. It was brilliant. I love it. It was brilliant. You're right there, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> so this is uh, uh, the lady there that owns the company, the one driving. She dropped me off in Anchorage, and it was about, I'd say, six in the evening, and I just thought, I'd, I'd get a few miles. So I... I hopped on my bike and I went up to a place called Palmer. So, and this is all bike paths out of uh, Anchorage. It goes like for about uh, 45 miles on path. Bike path is really, really beautiful. And this is the first guy I met with a gun. Look at his gun here. So I was there going, all right, how you doing? And he said, yeah, you can stay here. And I, I paid me 10 bucks or whatever, it was a campsite. And there was a few vans. And then he, uh, I, I put my stuff up here. But that was my first night totally on my own, like totally. He drove off then once he got the money and other people had uh, packed up the <coughs> evening and, and I thought, uh, well, let the games begin, bring it on, baby. And then I looked at his, his T-shirt that says, we test on humans. I was there all the time. <laughs> so uh, anyway, a couple of the buildings as I went along the way and I thought this was the best, the Alaska State Senate. <laughs> <laughs> It's real high caliber uh, building there. Uh, so I went along, I was going east of this stage this way and it was longer, but they said it'll, you, you won't regret it and they were so right. It was just, it was unbelievable scenery. So one night I camped under this glacier, there's a campsite, which is about here somewhere. But you can feel the cold off the glacier, that's how close you are. Mm -hmm. But it was pretty spectacular. And as, uh, so at this stage, here's Anchorage, you can see it there. and. I'm sort of heading east to go up to here. And I think this is, uh, hang on, let me just play a little video here. Tanuska, where I spent last night under a glacier. And the glacier just goes winding up the valley and it's just, oh my God, it's so beautiful. <coughs> this is here heading towards Glen Allen. And the valley goes right back there. And um, if you look around, the whole way around, like you, you're climbing, Steep climbs and then <coughs> steep down and then steep up and steep down. 
but the views are just stunning, really beautiful. And then there's sort of a different rock type up there. Not sure what it is. But uh, I'm stoked with the weather. It's roasting, sunny, no flies today. <laughs> no uh, wind, happy, happy day to look at that. Okay, so uh, off I went then and the rivers are just so beautiful and the scenery is just so beautiful and uh, everything is just really, really, really magical now I have to say. But as I went along I had to filter my water so like the rivers look really, really clean but uh, you have to filter the water. I bought this in Anchorage and I went in I thought I'd just buy a water filter but there's about 60 choices of water filters and I was just lucky that this one I got just suited me perfectly. So you fill the water from the river then it goes through this thing called a Sawyer pump uh, into your bottle and then happy days. Most beautiful water you ever had. So I'm heading a little bit north now. Uh, no, sorry, I'm still going east. That's right, I'm still going east. And here, this uh, Garmin, I used a Garmin uh, computer, an Edge 5020, uh, 520, sorry. And as I was going along, this circumference, you can't really see the colours there, but that's eight, at that highest peak is 8 hours, 8 hours 20 actually. So you can see you're climbing for 8 hours ish you know and that was about 85 miles 87 miles so <laughs> you'd love it guys you'd love it oh my god but uh, <laughs> but i think i think one of the things the climbing you're getting used to you're, you're getting used to carrying the weight but um the, uh, what, just to say to people on Facebook Live, we're having a couple of technical issues here with the keeping the thing straight, but we're going to get it sort of being on a second. But, uh, <laughs> good girl, Orla and Eileen. But um, as you're going up, I had a little bit of weight and I had extra weight at this stage because of the bear stuff, the bear spray and that sort of stuff. Uh, but then when I get into the Yukon, I had a bit more. But the problem, not the problem, but one of the challenges here was the heat because Alaska had the hottest summer on record. So wow. these days were like about 34, 35, but it was getting hotter. So, and my pasty Irish skin wasn't getting used to it really that quickly. So just some stats for the, because I know there's a few cycling nerds amongst you. Um, the mileage was 2,542 if you want to be specific. Uh, day cycling were 29, punctures absolutely zero, none. Oh, and and gator skins are your only man, I'm telling you. Bike maintenance, uh, and all I did was uh, clean and oil the chain and I used medium dry lube. I had the choice of obviously wet or dry and I just went for the medium and it worked really well. Uh, I had a trek checkpoint AL4, that should be actually, it's an AL4 with disc brakes and dropped handlebars, gator skins, the bike is up on the piano, where every piano, every bike should be, <laughs> it's up on the piano in the corner there for you to see, but um, the Ortley panniers, which are up on the table up there too, mm. if people want to see them, they're 100% waterproof, they're just incredible, they really, really are, and the handlebar bag here, 100% waterproof, and when it rains, and it, they've had the experience of heavy rain, they do stay, everything stays dry. And on the back here is my bear barrel full of other sort of bits and pieces. Thermarest, you see it all there, and the Garmin worked really well. So, uh, meters climbed 28,000 meters. Highest temperatures was 43. So, uh, yeah, I had a few days of 40, 41, 42, 43, and the Garmin doesn't lie, let me tell you. And then the heaviest weight was when I was in the Yukon, when I had to buy food for four days. And that brought me up to 100 pounds. And I know that because I found a way station and I went down to the way station. So that's without water and without me on the bike. So that's a pretty much a bit of a haul, I have to say. So uh, anyway, so I moved on and it was beautiful. Uh, and just this is heading up towards uh, northern Alaska now. So Fairbanks is over to the west. So I, I'm just getting further and further north, and wow. it just is just getting more and more beautiful. And were the roads empty all the time? Uh, not all the time, but uh, yeah, they're pretty much so. Uh, like, to be fair, uh, the roads that I were on, uh, sometimes you get a uh, little sections of road where there might be towns and stuff, mm -hmm. but like, not towns, but little yeah. inhabitants or whatever, and they'd have, you might have a few people. But this, uh, this is a restaurant, a pub I went into. I put this up on Facebook, so people might have seen this before. But these are moose, moose antlers, and the competition in the bar on a Tuesday night was to throw your bra up the high. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I said, I said to your woman, 
do people, uh, this is her here, like she's really happy for us, and she wasn't that chirpy actually. But I said, uh, where do you get it? Do people take off their bras and throw them on? She said, oh no, we get them from the charity shop. <laughs> <laughs> so the higher you get your bra up on the, the things, the better you do. But uh, this is a place called Glen Allen, and Glen Allen treated me really well. But Glen Allen, Glen Allen is an easterly T junction, so you either go south or go north. You can't go east any further. So I obviously went north, and this was my first road where there was a load of trees, nothing on the road, absolutely nothing for maybe 200. I, I, I was scared shitless going up here, and I was there with me, sort of thinking I'd meet handlebars, <laughs> which people, some people say are the best things, and other people say they're the biggest gimmick going. Like, but uh, I was just literally at four or five miles outside of Glen Allen, and this woman comes up, and she, she pulled up, and she, she said, hey, did you see the bear? And I was there going, oh God, and I said, no. And she said, he's headed for the river. And I said, where's the river? She said, behind you. And I was there, <laughs> <laughs> like the I took line. off. It's so this is, a, just for people to know, that's the spot, the that's the tracker uh, uh, that I brought with me. I brought it on all the trips, actually. Uh, but it worked really, really well, so people at home, my family could see me, basically. Uh, so I'm going up along towards this. Uh, this was my destination, northerly uh, Delta Junction. So I'm going up along here, and there was nothing, nowhere to camp, and there was no campsites or no, uh, nowhere. But then in the middle of nowhere, I saw this. You can see the hut type thing on the lake. Uh, it's called Lake Isabel, and um, I thought, Jesus, well, that's where I'm going because I'd already done about 118 miles. And I just thought, I want to stop where there's people. That's all I wanted, to stop with those people. And you can see they have all these toys. And they were from their ex-Vietnam vets. And they were lovely, actually. They were so good. <coughs> so they gave me a beer, which was brilliant. <laughs> and I set up their tent, because it was pretty windy. That's why I'm in right behind that trailer. <laughs> but most importantly, I got up at around half six. And there was already this care package, as they call it. But this was full of protein bars and... Oh different things and they said have a special trip wasn't that so nice yeah. <laughs> so they were really really yeah. kind this is like it was just wow. this was at about half six in the morning wow. it was absolutely beautiful and as i was going up along this section this is where the uh, alaskan oil pipeline comes eight minutes uh, uh, inches uh, in circumference and stuff but you see this in the sections and it's just crossing the landscape so on up i went and to me I would think that this was probably the most beautiful part of the trip. It was just, and the photos really don't do justice. It was absolutely mind blowing. And <clears throat> I have about four videos in this section here. And for some reason they wouldn't transfer across for me today or yesterday or the day before. But anyway, it, it literally took me, I'd say four hours to cycle about 20 miles only because it was just so beautiful. It was oh. just wowzer. Mm. You should all go there. <laughs> <laughs> And I got up, and so basically I got up to Delta Junction, which is here. This is the road up to Delta Junction. You can see how straight it is. Yeah. Uh, but that's the northern end of the Alaskan Highway. So you either go west over to Fairbanks or you go s east, uh, southeast. So I just put this in here to show you what the way it works. So uh, Tok, uh, Delta Junction's over here somewhere. And I cycled along this road to Tok. Now my original plan was to go this road. And this is all the gold rush place, you know, all the Klondike area. And uh, down here to Whitehorse, sorry, down here to Whitehorse and then down to Haynes Junction. Uh, sorry, down to Haynes. But with the fires, there was more fires here, there was more fires here, and this road was gravel for about 70 miles, which didn't suit the tires I had. So basically I went to Toke, where you stock up your food, because between Toke and Haynes Junction, there's very, 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 very little. So you have Beaver Creek where I have that, this thing here. And other than that, you have Destruction Bay where there's a tiny shop and otherwise there's nothing. So uh, that's a sort of a, a more detailed look. And when you zoom in on Google, you can see there's absolutely nothing. And where you see Burwash Landing or Kiko Lake or Snag Junction, you think, oh, there must be shops there. Or Northway Junction, there's Zilch. I don't know why they have a name on them, really, on the map. But uh, uh, you, might have, you, might have a ca you might have a campground, which would literally be one of those bare uh, containers. So you can put your stuff in that, but that's it. So I was in Toke and I stocked up, oh, sorry, I stocked up my uh, food. I don't know why that, oh sorry, 
uh, yeah. stocked up with food. So uh, this thing was the pièce de résistance for me, muscle men. <laughs> so I lived she on that because in. when you're cycling a lot, you, you, you take in a lot of uh, liquid. I do certainly anyway. And then I also had tins of mandarins, which are brilliant because they're full of sugar and they just work very well for me. I had protein bars, I had uh, trail mixes, nuts, raisins, mm -hmm. all that sort of healthy looking stuff. Mm -hmm. And I had tins of tuna, so I had a load, the, the, all the stuff isn't there, but I had a load of tins of tuna. Peanut butter again, but peanut butter is very hard to digest in the heat mm -hmm. and very hard to swallow in the heat. So the thing that worked for me brilliantly was muscle milk. And it made me really muscle. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so off I took, and you get this is my day all loaded up on the bike, and, and that was it was a heavy load. Like to to move the bike, you'd have to prop your leg against your body against it and heave it across. Oh you know, if you wanted to move it uh, laterally or whatever. Anyway, so I, these aren't my photos now, but when I was heading over towards the Yukon, these are Buckshot Betty's, who I'll tell you about in a minute, but Buckshot Betty took these photos, and uh, look, you have my main fear, <laughs> some people know Buckshot Betty's stories already, but my main fear were these three things, because you have the brown bear, uh, the black bear, and the moose, and the moose with babies, or their young, is the most dangerous, and they can buck forwards and backwards, and I saw loads of those. I really did. I must have seen maybe 20, 25, with some of them with their young. And so I really just didn't take any photos. Uh, and then brown bears and black bears, I didn't see any. Thanks be to Jesus. I did see their paw marks and their footprints, but uh, thankfully I didn't see any. But uh, the bears, the brown bears uh, are meant to be more dangerous, but locals in the Yukon, who I would really trust their judgment, they would trust the brown bear more than the black bear, because uh, the black bear is just as a contrary old bear in the language. Uh, John Sweeney sent me this very encouraging photo wow. of a grizzly bear, and that bear was only tranquilized by those, but uh, yeah. <laughs> So at night I had my bear spray right beside me <laughs> and uh, my notes about where I was going. And then you always, always, always went around with the bear spray. It was in a holster thing. You'd never go anywhere without that when you were off the bike. So one of the days I was in, uh, just coming into the Yukon, it was really hot. That was a 40 degree day and I was really, I was under pressure. There was like a lot of hills, a lot of heat, and there was a langer load of horse flies. Of big, they're not even horse flies, they're uh, uh, horse flies on steroids. <laughs> and there must have been 40 or 50 of them beside me, and I used to just transfer my mind into thinking they were playing a game. Mm -hmm. So they were buzzing and they were dancing and they weren't annoying me. And uh, I had to stop, and you can see the way I've stopped here, I just threw down the bike and moved away because I was just so thirsty, I was tired, I needed food. And I was sure I was going to be eaten alive, but they all hovered around the yellow panniers. They didn't come to me at all. So that was a lesson in itself. I was delighted with that. Mm -hmm. This is the uh, first border coming into the Yukon, uh, over the Alaskan border. Uh, just, and this is coming out of the, coming into the Yukon there. Sorry, earlier, I just threw them all. These are a few people that I met over there. So this guy here, he was from Taiwan, and he was oh. around the world. Oh. Like five years, he was finishing in Anchorage, so he was nearly finished. <coughs> This guy I met in California, he, look at all the gear he has on his bike. He was a writer and he was just traveling along. And these guys are from the Netherlands. They, were, they will probably be tuned in tonight, actually. Uh, so they were very nice. This is one of the first people I met on a bike path. He was on rollerblades and uh, he was practicing for ice hockey. So that stick in his hand is an ice hockey stick. I was preparing for the winter season. But, uh, so I came to a place called Dead Man's Lake and uh, there, it, there was nobody else in Dead Man's Lake only myself in this camper van and the camper van was uh, 400,000 euros or dollars worth you see the sides move out on it. so I was there all on my own and they didn't come out and the next morning some of you might have heard the story but the next morning they came out and this woman came out I was getting up at half six again or six maybe and then uh, she came, I was just getting my stuff ready over on the bench here and she came over in her white flannel trousers and the smell of uh, aerial clean washed up liquid on her. I was looking fairly bleak now, I have to say. I was filthy and she came over with a steaming hot cup, cup of coffee and I said, oh great, she's gonna give me a cup of coffee. And she's there, where are you heading for? No, sorry, she was English. She said, where are you heading for? Brexit. 
And the coffee wasn't for me, it was just for her, but uh, <laughs> she said, oh, the roads are terrible. And you can see my tires there, the it's roads just... were crap. I was on a bike, she was in a 400,000. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, she said, uh, what do you work at? And I'd never tell people I was a lecturer. You know, you just yeah. say I'm a teacher, but for her I said, I'm a senior professor. <laughs> And she just looked at me with disdain and said, oh my gosh, I'd never have guessed that. <laughs> so anyway, off I went, and you can see the Yukon roads. The Yukon is renowned for uh, having bad road surfaces and road repairs, so uh, that was all over the place. These are bear tracks, right, beside the road. But these actually, I thought were, this is, I put this in because of, you know, in the burn and people say the pollution of leave no trace and those little sort of sculpture things that is definitely one in uh, alaska and the yukon they put them in the sandbags so people put their names in stones mm -hmm. and there's a lot of them like there really is a lot of them so uh, i thought that what might be oh we lost our speaker here so uh, basically i'm coming out of um sorry now i just need to turn on the oh there we are uh so i'm coming out of uh dead man's bay and i'm heading east towards uh okay so it's about half seven in the morning and uh i'm just leaving dead man's lake which is a lovely name you can hear the bear bells <laughs> beautiful place actually a few kind of canoes there and stuff but everywhere is really smoky and uh, when i left Hoke, uh, about 200 and, uh, no about 180 miles ago it's uh, just been getting progressively worse. You can see it here, and it gets worse during the day. So that's why I was sort of leaving a bit earlier today. But um, so <coughs> seemingly there's fires up ahead. So I met a guy from Taiwan yesterday, and he's cycling around for the last five years. Imagine. There's those little main ones, and uh, he just said it's like soup further ahead and you can feel it going up you can feel it in your lungs going up the hills and my eyes are stinging so i think i'm going to go to beaver creek which is about 40 miles away 47 miles away i think i'll go there and then get a sort of update because uh three fires started in one of the campgrounds that i was going to stay in on the way down in destruction bay so there was three fires there two days ago so the whole campsite was evacuated so it's just unfortunate that the yukon is entirely encased in smoke when i'm here but that's all right like the views are meant to be unreal and, uh, i think i'm just gonna have to come back again so i think i'll just move south maybe and just try and uh, get out of this smoke <coughs> and um, make the most of these few weeks okay and I smell gorgeous. It's going like a barbecue. <laughs> 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 and to me, Beaver Creek was the one of the highlights. And it doesn't look that beautiful there. And it, like all it is is a little restaurant and uh, a pub and a campsite, or, like a little campground and stuff like that. But I met the best people there. This guy here is from Australia. He's great crack. He works over in the Salmon Island. This guy is a lorry driver. But also there, we ended up meeting all the fire crew that were working on the fires and they were just the nicest guys you ever met. But the ultimate person I met was this woman called Buckshot Betty. <laughs> Buckshot Betty to me is legendary. Like she is just incredible. D uh, as I always say, uh, she's like, uh, what do you call your man? The, the guy, the nature guy. Oh, Attenborough. No, no. I'll leave him now in a second. Bear Grylls. Yeah. Bear Grylls. Yeah. She's Bear Grylls, like multiplied by 50. Okay. Like she's <laughs> hardcore. Like she shot her first gun at six, and she shot her first bear at nine, and she skinned her first bear at 15. And, but uh, here's Buckshot Betty. That's her. <laughs> and this is her license plate. Buckshot Betty, the best buns on the highway. <laughs> Just so she had uh, she had the restaurant where she went was the only cop to that yesterday. But uh, anyway, Buckshot Betty, the firemen wouldn't let me go any further. They said, yeah, listen, you need to get a lift for 70, 70, 80 miles. So they said, um, Buckshot Betty in fairness said she'd give me a lift. 
but my God, I've never had a lift like it. She was just <laughs> inspirational. She really, really was. She knew every uh, otter's uh, set. She knew every eagle's nest. She knew so much about nature. And she had so many stories. Like she told me one story, I'll tell you one quick one, but it was about uh, in the restaurant in the winter and a Nor Norwegian guy came in or a Dutch guy and uh, she said, uh, she said, oh my God, this guy came in and he said, I, I like a burger. I served him the burger and the next thing I saw a bear coming into the refrigeration unit out the back. So I went into the kitchen, got my gun. I came <laughs> back and the guy says, where are you going? And she said, shut up and eat your dinner. I went out, I went out and I shot that bear and I looked back and the guy's knife and fork were on the ground and his mouth was on the ground. <laughs> But uh, she was just a pure legend. She, was just, uh, she really was a legend. And uh, we saw this place, uh, like one of the problems in the Yukon when I was there was the lack of water, so because of the hot sun. So this lake here was really dried out. And seemingly, Buckshot, Betty reckons there's UFOs in there, but she could be right. And this was my views. I know she was brilliant. I'd love to get her. I said, did you invite her to I did, of course. I said, would you come to Ireland? Hell, I don't want to go from the Yukon. So I, I don't think so. But uh, you can see the rivers, and this really was uh, pressure for them because fish, everything revolves around fish in Alaska and the Yukon, and the rivers were all drying up, and they you can see it there, like they really, really were drying up, and uh, so it was a major challenge for them. Uh, but anyway, so I headed down towards this place called Million Dollar Falls, uh, and I made this video actually for my nieces and nephews at home, but uh, I said I'd flick it. Okay, so when you arrive in the campsite early, because the next campsite is 105 miles away, you have time to make a video. So I'm here at Million Dollar Falls Campground in Southern Yukon, and it is, oh my God, absolutely unreal. So I just said I'd show you around. So this is my lovely trusty tent. It's great, it's working really, really well. Big Sky International. And uh, the stuff's sprawled all over the place. The oil. The panniers that are still left empty, and the bear barrel. It's working so far anyway, so far so good. And the one away on the table here, I literally just threw this out of my fingers when I got here. Uh, is there any kind of interest? Not really. Oh, there's my water feature there. I'll be finishing the water now shortly. Uh, the spot, which is working really well. And then um, it's food. This muscle milk is great because uh, I drink a lot of food and then. Reset the keep once I get water, it keeps working well. And then the what do we call those things? Empty tin of tuna, just had a tin of mandarins as well. I have these if I want them for later. Um, the Americans gave me those. And actually they're nice. They're and they're full of whatever goodness I'm sure. Uh, and then in here we have and my bear spray right at the ready, always, and my air horn, or American phone. My shades, my money, these things. I always carry one of these. Uh, they're probably really bad for you, but they they work really well. <laughs> so uh, I haven't used it yet, but I've that, I have two of those. And um, my Garmin. And then in here, I keep the lock, the key for my lock in here. It's very safe, even when the lock is on the bike. <laughs> and that never comes off the bike, but nobody never looking there. Um, a factor 50 and oh, a spare tube. I don't usually have a tube in there, but um, I forgot to pack it this morning. And then uh, what are we over here to show you? Therma rest just opened out just to try and help fill it a small bit. Um, my diary. And then down here, which is the PS de resistance. And then, by the way, I'm wearing my down jacket today, which I am. Delight. I just put it on there. I've been carrying it for two and a half weeks and today is the first day I've had to wear it. I'm up at higher altitude here and it's definitely cooler. But uh, it's much clearer. God, I'm so glad to that smoke. So this is downstream and that's going all the way down to a million dollars. All the way down there at Sharky. And then up here is Upson. And uh, so today I'm up above the trees and I'm not right here but I was above the trees and um, just touching the snow line which was there was bits of snow still on the mountains but this is just amazing it's just full of bumblebees Linda bee in her element dragonflies birds 
ship loads of bear stuff, but I haven't seen any bears. And I've seen a good few bear things, not here much, but um, I'm in the places where it's a time speed to show you macaroons and things like that. But um, I would recommend people come over here to Million Dollar Camp and free like stay home. It doesn't cost anything. And it's just gorgeous. Okay, I'll just give you an idea. Bye. That was that was an amazing campground. The next day I was really on bear alert because I was really on a remote area and the next day I saw these figures in the distance with the, uh, the backpacks on the thing and I genuinely thought they were bears. <laughs> 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 high-tech stuff. Uh, if you figure uh, you're seeing them in the distance and you're just on bear alert, you really do start to see them, which is uh, amazing. The silence in the Yukon, I, I won't play this video, but it was just so peaceful and so... I will play it for you, will I? It'll take two seconds. But this is... Just listen to the silence. Pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah. Like it was really, uh, really quiet. I think this is our last video, and we have one more after this later on. But this is coming up to uh, Chilcat Pass in British Columbia. I came over the Yukon border. I'm going over the British Columbia, and then I go over the American border now in a while. But uh, check this out. It was remote. <laughs> it's unreal. And you come up through, uh, you see loads of little prairie dogs, loads of rabbits, and there's not a car in sight. If a bear did come, good luck. <laughs> uh, but it's just really, really beautiful. You just hear the, the sort of wind blowing through the valley. And one of the things that people told me was, and the people that know, uh, they always said that when you do encounter a bear, just put your bike in the middle of the road, and then uh, the bear will sniff out your bike, and you just walk away and a car will come. But uh, in fairness, <laughs> in the Yukon, I timed it, and there were literally a car, there was a car probably every 45 minutes, oh. and I did think if I put my bike down, in fairness, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, like it's under pressure. And every single person you met over there was, how are you protecting yourself? Where is your gun? But uh, I obviously didn't have a gun. So I came over the border and I was, I'd done 120 miles and I was ready for something to eat and I knew I had another 40 miles to go. And they said, seven miles down the road, there's a restaurant, which is where this was, 33 miler. So that was the best thing of the day. And then the whole way down, you can see the incline or the decline. So I've been up here all the time. So this is about 30 miles downhill ish. So maybe, maybe 22, and it was just fabulous all the way down to Haynes. It was gorgeous. And as I was coming along this road here, I was pedaling along. I'd done my downhill, and it was just flat then. It was lovely. And this car came up along a, a van actually pulling a, ra a, a trailer full of rafts. And they held out a protein bar to me. And they kept moving, I kept moving. They gave it, they said, enjoy! And kept going. It was really, really cool. And in Haynes, I met this crew here. These were, oh, we went on the rip. <laughs> but they were making, I'm still in contact with them. They're lovely. They're English guys. And they're making a documentary for Discovery Channel. This is the director, producer. This is the cameraman. And they're up in the back end of uh, the Yukon, uh, in a secret location, uh, filming for Discovery on gold digging and gold, uh, you yeah. know, finding gold, whatever. And here, I thought this was pretty cool. You have the Alaskan liquor store beside the Oriental medicine and acupuncture. <laughs> I thought that was a nice mix. But, uh, so Homer was, oh, sorry, uh, dry camping available for three tents. And uh, there was a bear seen there that day or whatever. What's the alternative to dry camping? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, that, that was just a little patch of grass that was there, yeah. So the next day I hopped on a ferry for three days that brought Orla that's here tonight. We'd arranged to meet somewhere and hopefully go kayaking and biking in the, the islands, but it just wasn't going to work uh, time-wise and logistical-wise. So the cool thing about the ferry was you put your tent on the back and you didn't have to get a cabin, so that worked really well. <laughs> and uh, you can see the way the, the why the ferry took three days because it goes up around here and then it goes back to the same place. And 
But I met really, really cool people. <laughs> this was Orla's fella. No. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, these guys I met, I think they're going to be tuned in tonight. So these, I got on great with these guys. They're from uh, New Zealand. Uh, I used to keep saying Australia. But uh, now that the World Cup is on, I'm getting such texts from them. But uh, these guys, we used to have sundowners every evening. And you weren't allowed to have beer not you know, out of a thing. So we used to put them in the can into those little cups. But uh, they were great crack. I had good times with them now. Uh, so just moving on a little bit. Oh, sorry. Oh, the oh. So then he wrote from Vancouver, and uh, that was brilliant to see her. Mm. So basically, I met Orl up around here, and our plan was to go down this road. These are the San Juan Islands. So down here, and then Olympic National Park. We got a ferry across here. Olympic National Park around here, and then head south. So these photos here are from the San Juan Islands. It was really, really beautiful, but massive traffic. Jesus, coming from the Alaska and the Yukon. Yeah. And then to that was just, oh, wow. oh my God, culture shock. So we went on a load of beautiful trails. Uh, this is Orla looking gallant and everything. Orla <laughs> cycled across this America with me a few years ago. So she's well used to hardship and mileage and not a bother on her. And a lot of talking. And, and a lot of talking. <laughs> and all she needs is her cup of tea in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we came across beautiful lakes where we swam and uh, we were heading oh, wow. for the coast. It was just beautiful. When we got to the coast, this is a, a really cool place. The Pacific is freezing. Like it's really, mm. really cold. But uh, as we got to this place, which we both love, called Mo Clips, and uh, when we got to Mo Clips, we'd had a really nice day, and uh, we parked up our bikes, went for a swim, had a beer, and then we needed food, so we went down to the Shelburne Hotel. <laughs> <laughs> as well, you might. Another day, then we we pulled into this place called Seagate, and we were late. And they didn't really want to serve us food, but we actually worked our way around your woman in the bar and your man, and they served us food, and we, they let us camp in behind the, the back of the pub, so that was brilliant. <laughs> and the next day we went for a very, very, very posh breakfast in this restaurant overlooking the... Um, the, the restaurant probably cost us about a week's food, <laughs> but anyway, we deserved it. So we were heading south, and the Duncan Memorial Tree, somebody told us about that in the San Juan Islands, and this is my Garmin route here, down to Moclips, actually. Um, way detour, yeah. a detour. So we were coming down along here, and I texted her and I said, uh, I'm going to head up to see the world's largest red seed. Are you coming? And she said, No, no, I keep going. So that was grand. I went up this road, biggest mistake of my life. <laughs> I went up and I couldn't find that stupid tree. And it was like all bad roads, bad for the bike, bad for the gear, bad for me, bad for everything. So I came back down having never seen the tree. <laughs> <laughs> That's a photo off the internet. <laughs> <laughs> but as we came into these places, it was more cannabis guys like there was a map for where you could find the cannabis and where <laughs> the best place to find cannabis and all this sort of stuff one cool thing that was very good about the places the, the trails and around there was you pressed it like you pressed the light to go across the bridge so this one you, and it just let cars know you were coming which was a really nice idea yeah. but then sometimes you're under a little bit of pressure like this one here it said it, it presses for one hour you have to do uh 12 miles an hour for the next 11 miles <laughs> so you're there you're really pumping it when you're hauling the gear it's interesting you know Mm. Uh, so we pulled in here for breakfast one day and uh, then these two girls came in and they I think they're actually listening in tonight. This is Susanna and Anna and they're from Catalonia and they were great crack. We had great times with them. But uh, so <coughs> they had, um, one of the reasons I have included emphasised the philosophy behind these talks. These guys are both very sporty, so that's fine, but they had never ever gone on a biking trip before. They never changed, they never fixed a puncture before. They'd never changed a tire on a bike, they'd never fixed a chain or anything to do with a the bike, they'd never done. So we met up with them, Anisha Sarish, as we went along. So we're going down to a place called the Olympic Discovery Trail, and just to give you. Uh, and the Pacific is just over this mound, these sand dunes. We camped on the sand dunes last night, and we're heading now towards the Puerto del Waco. There's the Pacific there, look. Isn't that beautiful? There's Orla. And there's the Pacific Beach. It's just fabulous. Happy days. Woo! <laughs> there's the Bowl Orla Knights up there. She was actually saying her prayers there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, th we saw plenty of cool signs, but this one on the right I thought was <laughs> <laughs> Don't pick up any. So they must have been uh, going to run from there. 
But uh, Ireland and myself really found amazing campsites. We camped on the beach so many times. And uh, we had to, usually now if you're camping, you'd share a tent. But I had a one-man tent, so I wasn't going to bring a two-man, because Orla was only coming for the 10 days. So we had our tents and we used to camp on the beaches and in here there's a tank so we would camp beside tanks and we, we just basically camped wherever we could and the beaches were the best for us and it was free and it was beautiful and the sunsets were great and sometimes you found a fire it was like quality times wasn't it Orla? It was. It was. <laughs> These are the girls we uh, came across the girls we lost them for a while and we found them again and basically there's their fixed Functures and stuff. <laughs> but, uh, so we try to help them there. Uh, I'll flick across that one. This is Orla doing her thing going down the coast. That's her. She wasn't posing there, I promise. <laughs> I, I know, that's a nice photo of Orla there. Uh, but the beaches on the east coast were, or sorry, the west coast were absolutely phenomenal. And when we got to a place called Pacific City, so we'd come from here, we'd gone around here, I'm sorry, come around here and we were coming down here. We said we'd have a day off and these gorgeous looking surfing men were nothing to do with it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we pulled up on the beach and they were just, oh my God, weren't they lovely, Arla? <laughs> <laughs> and they used, to, they used to ski down the, the sand dunes and everything. So <coughs> one of the guys in the restaurant said, oh, just set up your tent there on the beach anywhere. So we set up our tents. Oh, this was great. And the next morning I heard, hello. <laughs> the guys here, the Gardaí were there saying, you can't go on the beach so Orla being the morning person sprightly jumped up and said oh we're fine and like uh, sorry to bother you and actually to be fair to them they were really really great so they said look you need to walk down the beach and go past this sign so this is Orla doing the walk of shame so here she is here walking and all we had to do is go down past the sign where the cars were parked and they said, uh, set up your tents there. But that beach was beautiful, it wasn't it, Orla? <laughs> uh, so, and then we went through this sort of housing estate place. It was an odd sort of a place. And there was deer just sort of roaming around. It was pretty nice, actually. But this was pretty cool. Went in Mexican food beside a gun shop. Like, why not? Uh, uh, every time. We bought a couple of guns there. Uh, and then Orla, it was time nearly for Orla to leave. So uh, ne we shipped next day air. So Orla had her... 10 days and plenty of mileage under her and never one complaint, <laughs> never one issue about food or anything. It was brilliant. She's the best cycling partner anybody oh. could ask for. Uh. <laughs> so this was a photo shoot we did for a local magazine <laughs> on, the, uh, on the last day. And uh, if you see, Orla was going to Rosenberg. Wasn't it Orla? Yeah. And then going up to Eugene and flying up there. So we had to get her back into the east again. But that was the photo shoot. And then there's a photo of Orla's fella the last night. <laughs> and this fella. But actually, this guy was a deer man. He called. I said, what's your name? He said, I'm the deer man. And I said, oh, fair enough. And I, this guy, I was trying to give him my bear spray because I needed to get rid of it because I couldn't fly home with it. And I was dying to give it to somebody who might use it. And he said, uh, oh, no, I can't go across the border. And he said, I'm a convict. So I moved swiftly on. So, <laughs> so Orla went east and I went west. And uh, I'm Billy No Mates again, heading down along the coast. And uh, again, one of the things that was a big challenge for Orla and me in that section was uh, timber lorries. And they'd come along at a thousand miles an hour with two uh, big trailer fulls of timber. And sometimes they wouldn't give you a whole pile of room. So there was sections of that that was pretty hairy. Wasn't there, Orla? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, there was a section, a section. So I came uh, down to the... When I left Orla, I wanted to get across the Californian border. And this shop was right opposite this sign. Literally, that sign was on the right side. This was on the left side. And it was dark. It doesn't look it in the photos, but it was pretty dark. It was getting dark. So I was getting my head torch and my yellow top thing on and the next thing the cops were just crawling along just in front of that looking at me and I was thinking I'm not going to be going over and buying blunts and dabs and buds and <laughs> edibles and yeah. those things like go and look for a real convict. So anyway I hopped on the bike and I pedaled away and uh, tried to ignore them. But um, this was my first campsite and it was re surrounded in, a, it was a real Indian reserve area or uh, First Nations as you call them over there. So heading down along the coast, we're getting uh, further down uh, along the Pacific and heading towards Redwoods National Forest in California. And again, it was getting really hot. Uh, this was me under a tree one day. It was just so hot. Oh my God, the humidity, everything was just really hard. And the vineyards uh, were in abundance uh, all over the place. Uh, 
And actually, I'm not sure what's happened this, but we have missed out on Redswood National Forest. But uh, you'll see it in the video in a second. But this guy in the campsite, I gave him my bear spray, so I was delighted to give it to someone. And this road was one of the roads for bikes only, and that was pretty hard on the old uh, rotter. But heading south, I have to say, was just so different. Like, if you're coming from Alaska and the Yukon, and then the further south, even the personalities changed, the characters changed. So like here we have, I know it's a bad photo, but this is a cowboy on a horse and he's herding those cattle and that's him herded, the ca he's actually herded the cattle there. And the people in the Yukon and Alaska live 100% by nature. Like they really, really do with fish, with wildlife, with bears. They shoot bears or moose because they need to eat them. If a moose is killed on the road, you report it because then somebody comes straight away and is chopped up and is used for eating, so it's not gone to waste. And also with um, the guns and stuff, you do see a different perspective of it because if you're living up there the whole time, I can understand why you might need one. And if you're using it, I suppose, to benefit feeding your family and stuff, that's a different kettle of fish rather than going around and shooting people. So there is an argument for having a gun over those areas, I think so. So uh, then I was heading down along past California, heading down towards San Francisco, and this is the last few days of these types of trips are always hard and i think um we'll hear that from joe mccall as well and i was saying to matt on his trip like just for the last two or three days it's always hard because i suppose you want to get there nearly and then you don't so you can see my track here this is on the spot tracker so that's the last day this is going over san francisco bridge and this is san francisco and this is a guy I met, he, he showed me all the back roads into San Fran just before you're coming in towards the, uh, the bridge. He was a cool dude, I tell you he was fit, because I'd already done 125 miles there and he was going 100 miles an hour and I was there, will I stop and take another photo, do you mind if I stop? <laughs> so this is the other side of San Fran, you can see it across the bridge. These houses here are boat houses, these, are, these cost about 2 million. Like they're ridiculous and that's why there's so much homelessness in San Francisco mm -hmm. and so a lot of the hippies used to live on these but now they're being sold for extortionate amounts of money and one of the issues in San Fran <coughs> for me, well for everybody, Jesus, for all, people over there was the homelessness mm -hmm. and people injecting themselves and when Orla and me cycled across America we started in San Francisco and that was many years ago, five Orla? Mm -hmm. And it was nothing like it is now. It's so bad now. It really, like, you meet a cluster of people on one side of the road injecting themselves. So you walk across the road because you don't want to get in their way or whatever. And there's another crowd across the road as well. It's like, it's very, very sad. So going across San Francisco Bridge, uh, pretty windy, but beautiful. Like, and it's great because you're on a bit of a buzz. And this is from the airplane two days later. This is uh, the road I came in. And then you go across the bridge and into San Fran. So it's all pretty good, but uh, that's that. Oh. So. Oh.